Hi, everybody. This is David uh, welcoming you from the Safety Doc Podcast Studio, which is now the Viterbo Educational Leadership Fireside Chat Studio. Actually, I do have a fireplace over on the right. Um, sometimes I reposition the camera so the fireplace is in the background. But you know what? It is not that bad this evening as far as far as temperatures. It is a brisk 57 degrees on the North Star weather dial down here in the studio. So, um, yeah, here's how these will go. Um, I'm going to mention three to four shout outs of specific student questions during each of these fireside chats. So I will denote these so... If you didn't receive a shout out during this um, fireside chat, it's possible you'll receive one in the next one or the one after that. So I do have four of them lined up for today. And I'm going to go through these first and then I'm going to go through the uh, week one reflective annotation and just give some thoughts back. So it is um, late night here on January 16th. 2018. Um, we've just started in class, so I've gotten to know a few of you um, through your post, and I'm going to be referencing some of your responses to discussion questions and then kind of going through the module um, one or week one, as we call it. So I do have the course. I have three monitors in front of me. So I guess to describe my system down here, I've got the headphones on, obviously, because I do the radio show out of the 405 Media in Los Angeles, California, um, daily at 2 p.m. PST, and also do a lot of work across the country via Skype with school districts regarding expert witness um, situations and also with legal counsel. So, yes. Um, I guess in that regard, I have joined the dark side. I did see Star Wars The Last Jedi, and um, yes, when uh, when Luke did become an expert witness for plaintiffs um, involving uh, litigation against defendants, which were the schools or school employees. So yes, Star Wars The Last Jedi. Wow. All right. Um, folks, here's what I've done. Um, I've, I went through and I compiled some uh, responses by four students, and I'm going to go through those, and then I'm going to get into the um, reflective anno um, annotation for this week and anything else that, that kind of comes to mind. Now, here's a few things right off the bat. One is I strongly recommend that you either watch or listen to these fireside chats. I mean, you can go in. And, and go into Google and, and type in, like, convert YouTube video to MPP3 if you want to listen to it. And there's a ton of those free services out there. Um, but really, I think it's important that you listen to this. Because if we were having this as a face-to-face -face class, this would be our face-to-face -face time. So um, I, I want you to put a premium on this. Now, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to do this, like, in an hour so hopefully we'll we'll stick to that. But you know, in one week, it's 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 going to give you a lot of information. It's real time. Um, again, it's going to cover things that we are covering, posts that you are making, some of the real time things that are going on. So, just starting off, um, if you are looking for how many posts that you have made, I've got the screen up to the right of me. Uh, once you log in, you see announcements, and then to the right hand side, it said search forums. If you go in there and type in and, and click on the uh, advanced search box, it will allow you to put your name in. And when you click on that, it'll bring up every single post that you've made. So it's really easy then to check if you have responded to your discussion questions. So one response to each discussion, discussion questions, two for each week and then um, for weeks one through seven. And then, of course, you are making eight additional posts during that time. I, I apologize if there's a little flicker down then in the video part of this. Um, I, I do have a high-end video card and, and am trying to get everything to merge with some new software here, but it shouldn't disrupt anything. And, of course, the audio should be good 
Um, I'll probably re-render this audio through my system before I, I punch it out. Ironically, um, for those of you who do like radio shows and things, you have to have a 16 LUFS uh, rating on any work that you do or else the radio station gets really upset about that. So I did have a show that went out um, tonight on the 405 Media out of Los Angeles, California. Um, kind of a funny thing is I made a post last night, and it received 30,334 impressions, um, including Scott Adams, who is the um, author of the Dilbert comics. Uh, Scott uh, does follow my work. And also Ed Lattimore, who was a heavyweight boxing champion. Um, and I do have a number of actors that um, that tend to follow me and, and that I've gotten to know over, you know, the, the years kind of in my work with Hollywood. So it's kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, I had 30,334 impressions just on a, a post I made about um, Plato and Aristotle and, and debate. Nothing I thought would really go go viral, but, you know, that's kind of the way things are. So um, let's see. Number two is I am working on an article right now for School Business Affairs Magazine, SBA, and I wrote an article for them last year. It is posted in this class. You'll get to it later on. But actually they contacted me and said, Dave, would you write a letter for us? Uh, or not a letter, but write a feature article that would focus on litigation um, for school districts and how to best um, prepare for litigation. And then if litigation does come upon the school district or individual staff, how to best um, defend against that litigation. I'm not an attorney. I do work with attorneys very frequently. Um, sometimes I actually have to, re to remind the attorneys, hey, I'm not an attorney, <laughs> so I can't give you like advice on these certain things. But, but I do know exactly, I think, where to go for a discovery um, I've been involved in some pretty high profile cases. I mean, these cases settle for eight, nine million dollars. So um, and and anyway, um, I do have that article that will be coming out in in they want to get it out like in March or April. So I wrote it and I'm going to rewrite it in the next couple of days and then probably rewrite it once again over the weekend and then submit it to uh, to the editor and and get it in there because it is it is something that is popping up. Uh, a nation, not nationwide, interna international um, litigation uh, specific to bullying and harassment, probably the number one and number two areas, bullying, harassment. So kind of in this whole non-discrimination area. Um, but litigation is is really out there. I, I get contacted, folks, um, on a weekly basis, if not, if not several times a week by lawyers all over the country saying, would you consider this case? Um, regarding school bullying or harassment or school suicide. Um, and, and all of those typically involve uh, directors of special education um, as parties that are named in the lawsuit. So um, not so much in Wisconsin. And, and personally, I do not accept any cases in Wisconsin um, because I, I, it's just a conflict of interest. I, knew t I know too many people, but... Um, it is, it is actually um, this weird splinter skill. <laughs> and uh, I, I work with some of the largest districts in the United States um, and, and, and work, at, last night, uh, worked extensively with a district, their insurance carrier uh, district on the West Coast on helping to prepare for uh, grooming education, meaning grooming for sexual trafficking, and, and the role that their student services director will play in that, their psychologist, how it will integrate into their counseling program. So um, kind of a splinter skill, I guess, that I've acquired maybe through the PhD, through the research I've done. And I guess I just, I just know this stuff pretty well. So I'm going to pass that on, obviously, to you during this class, during this class and, and hope that you never end up on the side of litigation, although anybody can be litigate, litigated against. Um, but I'm going to really make sure that you are very, very well equipped in the areas of pupil services and non-discrimination to limit your exposure to litigation. And if litigation does come your way, that you'll be soundly prepared for that. So um, I also posted, by the way, a podcast for those of you. I think I've, I've acquired a few more subscribers. I don't know if it's any of you. Um, to my Safety Doc podcast. 
I did put a Twitter post out to that um, in the class because this time I looked at um, the World Horth. The, yeah, World Horth. It's late. Okay, I'm, t- I'm tired. <laughs> I want to do this. Like, folks, I wrote all of this out. I have all of these notes, but it is kind of late night, and, and I'm, I'm tired. We're having a, a, a second bathroom. Totally got it and remodeled, so I had some work on that tonight um and 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 uh, you know spending time with my girls and homework and and we had dance night and stuff like that so but anyway um you know i i want to make sure that you understand what's happening from the world health organization the who not the band the who which are awesome but the world health organization and then the american psychiatric association because what's happening is um, video game addiction is moving its way into being recognized by the WHO as a disorder. And then that's a short stretch from being recognized by the APA, American Psychiatric Association, as an ICD-9 disorder. Now, when you have those happen, those are only supposed to be categories, but what they, they don't end up categories. Doctors take those and they move them into diagnoses. So what you're going to see in your school district is you're going to see a diagnosis for Johnny or Sarah has a video game addiction. This is a diagnosis that I have given them as MD doctor. And district now, how are you going to handle this? So are you going to handle it through... In OHI, through considering it and deciding not to do anything, um, a 504, I don't know. Um, but it is coming your way. And the fact that, that it has moved along this far, I really, really fight against this in my podcast because it is determined by what's called a Bergen survey out of Bergen, Norway. I think it's garbage. I think a lot of surveys are structured in garbage. They don't follow constructs. I'm really embedded into research. I work with some of the biggest districts in the country. Um, I know research. I'm an educational uh, researcher. Um, I just don't think this is a good model, but I can definitely see where this is heading. The weakness in this is is that um, insurance carriers are not going to support a treatment plan for video game addiction because there really isn't a treatment plan based on any empirical science. There's nothing out there. But what happens if it comes to a school? There will be some districts which will pathologize this and say, yeah, we'll accept this as OHI. We'll accept this as 504, and then we'll put some kind of treatment plan together. And that's going to really be the door that opens all of a sudden all of these students who are having video game addictions. So you as a student services director, this is squarely in your lap. Just want to make you aware of it ahead of the curve of what's happening. And you might want to do a little research on your own. So, you know, we hear about these ICD-9 codes with the, uh, you know, with the DSM, um, you know, the medical guide. And and really, ICD-9 codes are only meant to be identifying categories. But what happens then is is the medical sector has swiftly taken that and and turned those into diagnoses. So that, that... That's how that kind of happened. But you're going to see these. It it won't be long. I can tell you, if you're entering this career, you will see an order come across your desk from a doctor saying that this child is diagnosed as having a video game disorder per IC9 code, whatever, and um, take it from their school. And typically, I mean, the only options you're going to have is one to um, just not do i mean to 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 review it which you have to do due diligence and then not do anything with it or to um, process it through a potential ohi um, evaluation or to consider it as a 504. Um, so i i I don't know i have no idea how this is going to play out i want you to be aware of it though because this this is what's this is what's on the horizon and and the potential for this it, it, it can just really blossom in a fast amount of time so all right yeah you're like dave thanks for the great news hey for the podcast anyway so for my safety doc podcast i I think a few of you may have subscribed to it i don't know the numbers have gone up but um i do have the information out there you don't have to it's not an obligation but i do cover things that typically 
revolve around school safety or else community safety. And I have hosts on, um, you know, including, you know, um, people who, who work in law enforcement, you know, a specialist um, who, who um, Tom Marchetti, who worked in sanctuary cities and, and, and talking about the role of that, and that. But that's important to know because you're going to have students who, who might be um, undone, undocumented Im- immigrants attending your school. Um, and, and just the range of topics we cover, including um, things like situational awareness, understanding what the Taurus is, you know, that sense of, of, of trying to get a, a normalcy, what chaos is, how these things affect kids, um, and really diving down. Like, I, I remove the rhetoric, I get into the research, and, and I have access to the top people, top people in the world, top people in the world. Um, so it, it's really something that, you know, you might find of, of value to you, um, and you might not. So I'm just putting it out there, but I did, I did post a, a link, you know, to, to the latest podcast. I, I release typically a podcast a week, um, and it's, it comes out of, uh, it, it then it gets uh, broadcast into a radio show in Los Angeles, where I have a strong uh, audience, and then from that Los Angeles audience, um, it, 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 it ripples across the country and then across the world. Uh, ironically, France, um, Germany, and the Russian Federation seem to, to follow the show pretty strongly. So, And Canada. Thank you, Canada. All right. Dale, we are doing our shout-out section now. So we have four students I'm doing a shout-out to, which means next week I'll have four different students and then four different students the week after that. So if you didn't get a shout-out, don't feel bad. <laughs> So it's just like I can't do shout outs for everybody. But Dale, Dale, you wrote in response to discussion question one. After we know um, who and what parents may need, um, you know, what, what the parents might might need, uh, I think it is best to get a few parents involved in creating an educational event in our community. Word spreads quickly if parents are involved early on. Okay, I agree with that. I agree. I, 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 I think... Um, when I first started in one of my my districts, they had uh, fast families and schools together. It was a program that the the superintendent really didn't support. I guess as far as we didn't get funding for it, it, it kind of died. Um, but but here's something else: most um, CISA support parent liaisons, training parent liaisons. So if you have a parent of a student with a disability. Um, and and you feel that person is is would also benefit from professional development, networking with other parents, and could benefit you um, and the district. Uh, for example, you have a, a, a student who moves to the district with a with a significant disability. This parent might be able to, to meet with that parent and say, "Hey, I've my child went through this district or is in this district, and and any questions that you have, um, here's how things typically operate." Here, I, I can attend an IEP meeting to make you feel more comfortable. I had that in my in, in one of my districts, and it was phenomenal. Um, this lady was awesome. Her daughter, her, her son had, aut- had not autism, Down syndrome. She was an outstanding parent liaison, and she would mention things like, you know, we started a school to home, and in in back, you know, communication notebook, and that was really helpful in 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 these type of things. So. That's what I would say is the parent liaison programs through your CISAs. Investigate, investigate those, you know, in, in helping to get, um, you know, parents who you think can be, can be leaders to, to help them. And then those CISAs connect up into um, Wisconsin Parent Educational Initiative programs where they, they, they also get trained. The, the parents get trained. I, it's really cheap. For a district, it's like three, four hundred dollars a year to to feed into to having this this parent liaison. So it, definitely check that out. So an educational event, it's a great idea. So Dale, it's a great idea. Just be precise on what's presented and how it will be presented. Um, so I got burned on this one time because I had a parent who rented the performing arts center and did a presentation on. Um, di- diabetes and and working with diabetes and and how she personally worked with her son with with diabetes. Now, the issue with that is like she was not qualified to do that because she didn't have a medical degree. Um, she was just speaking from the parent perspective. And one of the things that she said in this was, 
you know what? My son has type 1 diabetes, and here are some shortcuts that I do. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Like, all of a sudden, like, people in the audience are hearing that and, and looking at this person as the expert and kind of vet it by the school district. So it was really very touchy. And this parent did not respond well when I, when I met with this parent and said, listen, you know, like, I want to work with you. But we, we've got to coordinate with, with either a medical professional on this. Like you just can't rent the facility and then present on something that you're saying is pseudo school protocol. And she ended up vent, r- renting like the VFW hall and it got, you know, kind of adversarial. And oh, I'm like, oh, whoa, that's not where I wanted that to go. But, you know, these are the things that I think these, these make sense to have parents involved, but maybe like parents and teachers presenting together. Um, or a prof- a medical professional, a pharmacist coming in, presenting about like some common medications or what might make kids sleepy or dry mouth or whatever, things like that. So I, I just, I, I, you want to make sure that you have people presenting who are qualified to present um, because, you know, you have a liability with with that. So, and I think these things can quickly erode into, you um, sessions of, uh, you know, more like complaint sessions and the airing of grievances, you know, get out the festivist tree and let's do the airing of grievances, which you don't want. Um, now, with that said, I think it's okay for people to say, uh, as a director, when I would participate in things like this, I would stay afterwards and say, you know, if you have issue, not issues, but you have questions or, or you don't agree with some things we're saying, I'm going to stay here and, and I'll respond to your questions. And, and that worked out well. Um, but yeah, so, so thank you. I definitely appreciate your statement of, you know, um, wanting to, to get parents involved in, in the educational event to giving them leadership roles. Rachel, you wrote in response to discussion question one. So here's your Rachel shout out. Dun, 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 dun. Usually like I do extensive editing on anything that I throw out on the radio. These probably won't have that. Um, and I might go through and just uh, readjust the microphone um, audio setting a little bit. We will see. Um, the director said, just so you know, by making this decision now, you will have a senior in high school who will be 18 or 19 the whole senior year. You mentioned how you had made your mind up to hold your child back one year. Okay, and, and you kind of got blindsided by the director who said, you know, by the because you made this decision, you're going to, all these consequences to deal with down the road, you know, like years and years and years from now. Um, you know, like the implications of the students signing themselves out, truancy, possible high school dropouts, and, you know, you will not have any rights to consign them. You said, you know, you were dumbfounded by that. You weren't expecting that. So my response to that, you know, I, I, first of all, I think that's totally, <laughs> totally irresponsible by the director to do that. I, I, I think that should have been brought to you beforehand. Um, and again, who knows if those laws will even be in place by the time your child graduates, but those points are valid, but it's not valid to throw out there in kind of this like hammer format of saying, well, you've made this decision. So here's the consequences. I think, I I don't agree with that. I think that that was not a good step. So I refer to this whole thing as crystal balling. And I've said this in other, um, fireside chats. I've done this crystal balling effect. To some extent, this needs to be done. Um, like Brianna, Brianna, I mean, in your 18 through 21-year-old program, you know, you need to to very much be in tune to, at that point, what the student might be doing six months from now, 12 months from now. You, you've got that pretty, pretty closely identified. But we're talking, you know, in situations when you have a third or fourth grader and, and people come to the IP meeting and they're like, this is exactly how their life will play out. This is what it'll be like at 18, at 21, at 25, at 30. And there's like no exception to this. I call that crystal balling. That's garbage. Stay away from it. If you see that as a director, step on that right away. Um, so it, it immediately lowers the expectations and rigor for a student when you get into crystal balling. And and most of the time, students will, will far exceed these, these expectations that we think we have for them, that we pattern out for them and things like that. I call it projected benchmarking. It's um, basically thinking like one student was kind of like this student. So like the student we're talking about now in, in 10 years will turn out exactly like this other student. That's garbage. It's garbage. But people do it. Um, I remember 
when I was teaching early in my career, like 20 years ago, third grade teacher said at an IEP meeting and, and blew the psych and I out of the water with a statement. He said, you know, he's talking to the parent. And this was a student who, it was mostly like an academic IEP. You know, we didn't have a lot of, a lot of concerns about the student at all. And the parent and, and the teacher said, you know what? This student is following um, the same behaviors as a boy that completed suicide as a high schooler. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe you just said that. So first of all, nothing is the same, everything's similar. There's no such thing as sameness. But anyway, um, you know, those, those types of things where people pattern and, 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 and just say, this is exactly how the student is going to end up, or they're going to end up very, very similar to how this other student ended up, or I've, I've gone through this a hundred times. This is exactly how it's played out. Garbage, garbage, you know that. It's garbage because um, students... <laughs> Students change. Students students grow. And the other part is we don't know how, how the old the whole technology and instruction side evolves. You know, kind of the float all boats. Who would have thought 15 years ago that we would have an iPhone and smartphones? You know, that are basically now you can enlarge text. You can um, you can have your calendar right there. It can read it to you. Um, you can get your email, you know, messages. It can give you the weather. We have students who are visually impaired, and it coordinates the satellites and tells them where they are. So this 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 whole thing of of uh, crystal balling, if people start to do that, especially in the elementary age, we got to put an end to that. Of course, we need transition planning, which is more connecting with outside agencies. And again, Brianna, I'm re- I'm returning. I'm referring to Brianna uh, Gustafson with uh, DeForest. You know, she works with the 18 to 21 year old program. In 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 that case, you know that that becomes a much narrow win- window, and, and you are putting things into place which are going to happen in a very short time span. Um, but again, I I'm, I'm referring to this crystal balling where it's like, ah, I can see the future for 10 to 15 years for this dude. That's exactly how that'll be. The other part of this is parents do this too. Parents will come to IEP meetings and say, this is my student will only be able to do this, or they'll have you know, the, the, whatever set of expectations. And it's like, you, you have to let the time elapse and that student to grow just like any other student before you can make a determination. Um, uh, when they get very close to exiting school of, of, of more or less, you know, what, what their next step is going to be. So anyway, you're going to, you're going to come across that. You're going to come across a lot of pressure with that. So in response to the discussion question, number one, Mark wrote about the parents' rights brochure and how it is complex and can be a barrier between the parent and the school. Mark, you're completely right. It is a, a document which is, um, you know, when I, I, I was in college, I went to, uh, I road tripped um, for spring break to Little Rock, Arkansas, which I, I suggest nobody ever, ever, ever do. Um, I remember going down there and just being stunned because they still had the gas pumps where the numbers, the dials turned, you know, when you fill up with gas. But anyway, um, the deal here is that it's complex. It's like trying to fold a, you know, a roadmap of the world. Um, nobody understands it. It, It's a formality. It's, it's, it's way over the top. Um, so, you know, you wrote in MPS, I've begun to see parents being more, Um, be given more opportunities to educate themselves in the whole IEP process. That's great because I think, yeah, you know, helping parents understand the IEP process, what their role is, questions that they can ask. I love IEPs that are very tangible. You know, like if an OT comes in and says, I was working on whatever, bring in that piece of equipment and show the, show that at the IEP meeting. Like I was working on this and this and this, you know, like these are actually tangible things, you know, those help. Um, By doing that, I believe that is a non-discriminatory, discriminatory process, meaning um, you are helping the person that you understand that you're decreasing the vernacular, the register, the the lingo, the language that we have in schools, which serve as a barrier between the schools and the parents. So we don't, we often don't know that. Um, but, but by reducing that, by starting to eliminate that, be, becoming very um, concrete instead of abstract, you are actually decreasing this kind of discriminatory discriminatory process. So, all right. Um, We have historically sent, this is what you're saying, Mark, we have historically sent out student rights over the course of the year. This has been an attempt to have parents understand IEPs better. Um, However, these may not 
uh, I've been the most parent friendly. Yeah, they're not at all parent friendly. Um, wording can sometimes be confusing. They're, it's always confusing. And they are meant to be read by parents with no clarification from special, edu- yeah, special education. Absolutely. Uh, these, things, these things are absolutely ridiculous. They're, they're completely ridiculous. Completely ridiculous. That's why I think um, it serves you well. And, and again, I think this becomes a, discriminat- a discrimination issue because – if you have an, uh, um, a college you know, degree and in intellect um, to be able to decipher this, obviously you're pulling more out of this, you're understanding more of your rights. Um, I represent it, I didn't represent, but I was in a case where it was a father who was a blue collar worker. Um, and he did not realize, you know, didn't, didn't understand the, the school lingo that was being presented to him and, and his son you know, regarding his son in a very complicated legal case. Um, And I argued that in my expert witness report saying, you know what, the vernacular of what was presented to this father was well above this father's level. And not saying the father's not intelligent, but I'm like, this stuff was registering out at 12 plus on various readability levels. So I'm like, people knew what he did as a profession. It was documented. Um, and and they needed to ask questions. Do you understand this? Do you have questions? Or else just to bring this down to a reading level, which was was more um, accessible to him. So here, Mark, here are some of my thoughts. Uh, Mark, you know, you're spot on with a confusing uh, document known as the parent rights pamphlet or novel or whatever they call it right now. Um, you know, they call it the sad day for the post office when you bring those things down. Um, the other design flaw and sending out such documents is that there's no way to check for understanding. So they're all passive. You know, it's like you get it and it's like, I have a question about this, but I don't know who to call. I'm not going to call anyone. So they're passive. It's the same thing, excuse me, with like surveys. So I consult with some of the largest school districts in the country and have a, I've recently helped a uh, district uh, larger than any district in Wisconsin. I helped a district with a readability level of their student handbook. So they they were looking at their student handbooks uh, at the middle school level. And, uh, you know, one of the discussions I had with them is I said, you know, let's run this through some readability um, scales. So you can go online, find a number of them. They're all, you know, that are endorsed by the reading organizations. And, and you can copy and paste paragraphs in. And, and we were finding that a lot of these were testing out at 12th grade or post 12th grade level. And I said, one, your students aren't understanding what's in your handbook right there. That's an issue. And I said, that's an issue, one, because students aren't understanding it and parents probably aren't understanding it. The other part is if I if I came in as an expert witness, if you were sued because you're, you, the student was bullied and didn't understand how to report bullying or what bullying and, and harassment was, and you said, well, they have the handbook and whatever, I would look at the handbook and say, yeah, the handbook comes out at a rehabilitability level of 12th grade, student is sixth grade, plus they have a disability, um, you know, autism or reading disability, and there wasn't an IEP goal to go over understanding those portions of the student handbook. And, and pretty much once I've done that, that's case closed. Um, and, you know, I don't want to make this a scary, frightening, you know, lawyerish type thing. I'm not a lawyer, but I will say when I've been in expert witness cases, people do not recover when I when I point those things out. I know exactly where to go. I have <laughs> across the country, it is it is the same. I mean, I, I go in and I ask for your student handbook. The student handbook, you know, we do this under disclosure. It is a subpoena document, and sometimes districts actually won't even give those things out because they 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 know they're going to test out at high reading levels, and we just obtain them from people you know who have had students who go there, and uh, I can quickly point that out and, and quickly argue that to um, in, in in my report of just saying these documents were produced at a level which was not reasonable for understanding by the students, and there was also not a check for understanding. So again. You know, you can do this is this is a great activity, Mark, that you kind of brought up here. Um, the parents rights brochure really needs to be taken on by the by the DPI um, to make that more under, understandable. And, and they did do that at one point, kind of trying to break that down. Um, I don't know where that's at. You could kind of hunt for that. Um, I don't even know if it still exists, but but I, I, I definitely 
do think whatever, for example, is in your handbooks regarding bullying, harassment, threat to self, threat to others, and how to report that, you take that, you copy that into multiple free online endorsed by, you know, the National you know, Reading Association and so forth. Um, and and, and you, you come up with the fry scores and whatever. And, and typically they're going to be high. I mean, I've never run one of these ever in a district across the country that's come out at like a seventh grade level. They're always high. And then we work to get them down. And usually we work by getting them descriptive instead of like conduct, conduct disorder. You know, we replace that with more descriptive terminology. And um, what it does then is, is it, doesn't, it doesn't create like a simplified feel where people are like, oh, I feel like I'm being, this has been brought down to a level. No, I, I think actually people appreciate the more descriptive terminology. So I don't want to get too much into that. But you know, that is something very important that as a director you look at because it does have to do directly with uh, people services and non-discrimination. So, um, dun, 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 dun. yeah, so check out those handbooks and it's easy. That is something you can report on to in your uh, five-year people services report to the DPI. You know, making you know you can you can make that statement. These are these are terrific things to share with a school board, um, and you can get a committee together. You can get parents involved in that too, saying, you know, here's here's what we have to describe bullying in the handbook. Um, it kind of tests out a little bit high, you know, like maybe eleventh, twelfth grade reading level. This is our middle school handbook. What can we do to to work? And, and then you can kind of plug things in, you know, new terminology, throw it back in. And, uh, and and start to recalibrate that to a level which is more in that middle school level. That will serve you very, very well, not only for understanding of all students and universal design for access, right? We want students to understand these things. And I think a lot of these things should be an IP goals or not. I think districts should do that. I'm writing a goal. Um, I'm writing a guide for a state actually to implement um, IEP goals specific to how to teach students to become um, uh, more aware of harassment, of bullying, and the threat reporting system, and also competency of using the threat reporting system um, in their district. So very, very prevalent. Jeffrey! Dun, 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 dun. Jeffrey, you wrote in response to discussion question one. You said, I would suggest that an observer of 100 um, or hundreds of IEPs and hundreds more of an LEA, you know, meetings. So you've attended, obviously, a lot of IEPs um, that we speak in parent-friendly terms, referring to a page as an I, whatever, is a foreign to everyone in the room except the author. And, and those have even changed. Um, I have asked our teachers to have color-coded tabs to guide IEP participants. I ask that they highlight key changes in the IEP. I'm with you. I'm with you. And again, this is roundabout. This is a roundabout way of actually um, tackling de facto discriminatory practices. Um, and a few things here, you know, for, think about English language learner parents, you know. So if, if, if you're, you know, you know, trying to navigate, here's the I4, here's the I6, I9, whatever. Um, I would number pages with a marker, boldly number them just sequentially after, you know, they would be printed off. Be like, let's go to page eight, and re whatever was on page eight, and 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 I really I believed in that because people knew, and and more and more I had people write their names next to sections that they did, so then people around the table could identify that. And here's something I here's something I did which I I really thought was was powerful is I bought um, whiteboard name placards that people would put in front of them when they were at IP meetings. And uh, they would write their name, you know, in a dry erase marker, and they could write their title, like, you know, math teacher, the parent could write whatever in parent. Um, and how many times do we get around a table and we're like, I don't know who that person is. I don't know. They came with the parent. I don't know who they are. Or even like in your own district, like, I'm not sure. Is this this person? They're here from the middle school. I'm an elementary teacher. This is a transition thing. Oh, I forgot their name. I don't know what you're going to. You're not going to ask a question. You're not going to say um, whatever. Because, I mean, that's just going to feel awkward. So you put these name placards out. You can make these things. You can buy that dry erase board stuff at any, you know, Menards, Home Depot, whatever. And your shop classes can make these things up. And, and then you've got them. 
But I have I believe that is a huge a huge practice as a as a special education director to get those those name placards around the table. It fosters discussion because otherwise people aren't going to ask things because they don't want to be like, oh, hey, I forgot your name. I forgot your name. Well, then, <laughs> that just looks weird, right? Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to say, hey, like, um, you know, I forgot your name. Um, and you're trying to write down everybody's name as you go around. It's like, no, you know, you, you, you use, use the name placard. It removes that, it removes that barrier. Just a, just a pointer there. Because I do think it fits into this subtle discrimination component, you know, of what we're talking about in class. So I'm going to give some practical knowledge as, as well as authentic knowledge, book knowledge, whatever. So I don't know. The class has always been well received. Like it's always received very high ratings. Not a hint, hint. Please rate the class well. Rate the class however you feel it benefited you. I mean, I've been doing it for 15 years. It's it's come out well. I've had students contact me well after classes ended. Um, unfortunately, I, I had a student who uh, contacted me after the class had ended and, and I think had a triple suicide in her district. This was a couple of years ago and uh, was a new director. And uh, I met with her and, and, and actually walked her kind of through what I thought would be the the best practice to help her respond and, and, and work with her staff on that. When I do those type of things, folks, I do that for free. Like you take this class, you contact me, there's an issue of something like that that goes on in your district. I'm there for you. Okay. Just so you know, um, you know, that's the, and that's part of being Viterbo. That's part of being a servant leader. You know, not that you're calling me on every, you know, thing and running it past me, but I mean, if something substantial like that happens, you bet, you bet that I'm there for you a hundred percent. So I'm, I'm going off our week one school-based miscell, uh, miscellaneous pupil services, uh, reflective teaching annotation. So you have this. Um, anyway, so the first one is very often in pupil services programs. Uh, one is an administrator is confronted by a shortage of information about a particular matter that requires immediate attention. Be careful not to jump the gun. Okay. Yeah, the first thing here, and I, I, I mean, I learned this too. Like I learned, I'm, I'm talking from experience in this. Um, is you, you need to. What, what's going to happen is um, the parent is going to call. They're going to call upset. Something might have happened. It might happen at midnight. Might have happened at two o'clock. My child's just been been wild tonight, and I've I've had phone calls from midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning on my phone. And I answer these, you know, and I go through these. I'm thinking, okay, the parent didn't get a hold of me. They probably called the principal. They might have called the superintendent, whatever. So I'm going through my circles of saying, hey, first superintendent, if you've heard about this, I've heard about it. I'm on it. I'll I'll keep you apprised. So the superintendent knows that. Um, the second one is, and I'm going to the principal, and I'm saying, you know, were you contacted in this? If not, like I'm giving a, a debriefing to the principal and also to the teacher. So I will contact the, the parent in a very timely manner and say, hey, I, I, I received this message. Um, and then kind of jotting down, you know, like, I just want to have it straight. You know, like, these are the things. And, and you know, one of the things I do, I, well, I don't do this much anymore, but one of the things I did is, is I bought a, um, I bought a record. I don't know if the phones have escaped, Billy, but I bought a recorder. It's like 40 bucks, like a Sony recorder. I would tell the parent, I'm going to put you on speakerphone and I'm going to record this call. And I'm the only one in the room. But the fact is, like, if I can record this, then I can write down notes and I can go back off of the recording and I can write things down. If you feel uncomfortable with that, I'm not going to record it because I don't want to um, breach a trust that you and I have. And the recording will be erased after, you know, this this is done. But um, I, I want to fully understand what you're communicating with me. And 99% of the times the parents said, yeah, absolutely no problem with that. And then I did do that. I, I authentically did record those me those, and I played them back. Um, but I did not keep those in in and use those ever to come back to a parent and say, "No, I've got it on recording that you said this at this time." So, but um, you know, just wanted to put that out there. So, anyway, um, yeah, check with your principals and, and and teachers and everybody because they've likely been contacted too. And when I call a parent back, I say, you know, listen. Um, I received the message. I want to make sure what your concerns are, what you want is an outcome that I might not be able to deliver. And then I'm going to look into this and I will get back to you by, you know, whatever and, and give a time. And then that buys me time. The parent then typically is satisfied with that. Um, and it gives me time then to make connections with the professionals. Um, you do not want to 
call back and, and say something like, yeah, the principal, oh my goodness, I can't believe the principal did that or, or whatever. That's not been my experience with the principal or whatever. You know, get, get away from all of that stuff. Just say, you know, I want to I, I, I gather information so I'm better informed to help you. I, I want to be the best informed I can be when I call you back um, so we can, we can, you know, get to a resolution in this matter. Parents respect that, and your staff respect that too. They'll never feel like you're throwing them under the bus. So the thing you need to do also in this whole thing at some point is talk about discretion with staff because with site-based management, staff will have discretion to different levels. Um, I know some buildings where, where staff, the principal, kind of handled everything, didn't document anything. The problem with that is when you don't document, you don't create a record. And that record might be very necessary if something happens um, involving that student at a later time. And then we go back and it's like, well, we don't really have like any entries into the school system. And it's like, well, yeah, this happened, this happened, but I handle it or the teacher handle it. It's like, well, OK, like we've got to understand that we, we need some inter reliability on discretion. We need to understand what discretion is and what is discretion. Just wait a second, folks. I think I actually have a definition for you. Yep, I do have a de definition. So. Um, because I needed to do this for one of my major clients out west. Discretion has four parts. Um, discretion. So when you talk with staff about discretion, because this this is if if you don't have this discussion, you're going to end up with with probably one of two things happening. One is you're going to end up with like a zero tolerance um, perspective where everything is going to be like the student did this, boom, they're out for three days, and and then it's your issue to deal with the parent. Um, and the other side of discretion is that it is the teacher who's going to handle everything or the principal, and you're never going to know about it. Um, and in those cases, then you don't have documents that are created, or if they're created, they don't become records. They don't get entered into whatever, Skyward Infinite Campus, whatever system you use, Oasis, whatever it could be. So when you talk about discretion, this is very important as a pupil services director, talking about discretion with staff. You're talking about Interpretation of rules. So what are the rules? How are you interpreting those? Two, consideration of alternatives. So what are the different ways you can handle this? Three, application of a value system. So um, everyone's going to have a different value system they're going to apply to to this. And, and, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's going to be a value system of saying, you know, I'm going to give the student the, the benefit in the doubt for this uh, benefit of the doubt for this or the teacher the benefit of the doubt because you know um there hasn't been a a past practice of this or whatever so you know that's where i'm at but then we don't have a record created the fourth is the ability to exercise free will to select a course of action meaning um here, here's the perfect case in in october, in october come on um on uh, december 1st 1958 as a firefighter, I know this ingrained in my mind. It's sad. Um, December 1st, 1958, the Our Lady uh, of the Angels um, Catholic School in Chicago, Illinois, um, about 20 to 30 minutes prior to the end of school day, a fire broke out um, and smoke was detected in a hallway by a nun who was also a teacher. Now, the discretion was very, very narrow in the school. You are not to make a decision without contacting Mother Superior. The nun did not pull the fire alarm. Instead, the nun tried to seek out Mother Superior, went all around the school, and Mother Superior actually was teaching a class. Uh, by the time the nun found Mother Superior, another nun had realized the fire was progressing, had pulled the alarm, and, and many of the students evacuated. Unfortunately and, and devastatingly, 92 students perished in the fire and three nuns. Um, we've had nothing to this day that's measured to that, but this comes into a very um, a, a very deep discussion you need to have with staff about what is what is discretion. Um, so anyway, yeah, professional discretion. What is it? And, and you know the, the components. And, and everybody needs discretion to operate. You need discretion to operate. But as the year goes on, that discretion seems to be elastic. It stretches. And if the, the probably the biggest liability that you're going to encounter as a pupil services director is people handling things and not entering them ever into a system that they've been handled. 
um, or people who might have questions of something, but they decide, eh, I've got the expertise or whatever to handle this. I'm going to handle it instead of kicking it up and seeking clarification on that question. Um, so you always want to foster that. If you have any questions, please ask a superior, a principal or whatever, or ask me. Again, I'm talking from an expert legal witness standpoint. Um, cases that have been very strong for plaintiffs are cases in which plaintiffs and, and systems have had opportunities to ask questions. Um, here's an example. You know, like a student is exiting, you have a bomb threat, and a student is exiting a bill. you know, all students exit a building. High school student doesn't want to leave without his backpack. He's like, no way I'm not leaving here without my backpack. Policy is not to leave. You know, backpacks have to stay. You have to leave without a backpack. Students like, I'm not leaving. So the teacher drags the student out of the building. So, you know, was that was that the right thing to do? I mean, so <laughs> you know, tabletop exercise probably would have worked that out ahead of time. Um, but again, you know, was that something that was, what, what was your professional discretion? Personally, for me, I would have let the student go out with the backpack. I know who the student is. They have some attachment with his backpack. It's not policy, but am I going to fight it? Am I going to make a big scene out of it? No. So here's something. In other words, it, the, the best interest of the child is determined by the administrator's professional assessment of the context and situation at the time of the decision. I want to point that out very clearly, very clearly here. Best interest goes all the way back to when schools were founded. You act in the best interest of the child, in the context and the situation. Those are core legal terms. There were 60 studies by, I don't know, Stefkovich and whoever. But anyway, 60, 60 studies, and they all found that those, th those interpretations are specific to the situation and the context of time. Meaning, if I'm asked to say, like, was this a reasonable act of best interest? I don't know what, what your context and situation was at the time. That's hard to, to reproduce. If you felt that that is what you needed to do in that situation and context in the best interest to pre preserve the safety of yourself and your students, then you're typically in pretty good standing. Again, I'm not an attorney. I can't give legal advice, but I'm just telling you. Best interest of the student. Above all, if you're acting in the best interest of the student. And that's also, it is a legal term. It's been around since the beginning of the educational process. So, and I, I think the question is, what what's the right thing to do? What are the potential consequences? Sometimes a board can, you know, stomp on you or exit you from employment <laughs> because of what you've done, um, you know, or you can, you know, get the wrath of, of your you know, higher up, or you can get the support of your higher up. I don't know. Personally, I would always default personally to acting in the best interest of the student in the context of the situation, because you will never, ever, ever be able to recreate the same context and situation. There's no such thing as same. From a scientific standpoint, there's no such thing as same. There's similarity. You know, we can, we can have a blueprint. We can build a hundred school buildings of those hundred school buildings off that identical blueprint, none of them will be the same. They will all have some discrepancy, some tolerance within them. You know, the building itself will be a little bit different. So, all right. Although truancy is an elusive problem, the reality of the situation is rather simple. If a learner is not um, in school, they will not be well educated. So, yeah, basically, here I just say go to the CDC website and download that study. And there's an updated version of that, I believe, um, the the, re, the CDC report on school connectedness. If you just go CDC plus school connectedness, it's a terrific website. You can get a ton of resources off of that. And it comes down to basically saying, you know, if you get kids connected to school through a lot of your PBI, PBIS activities, other things, um, there's this, this massive research supported meta-analysis meaning many research documents support this, um, decrease in truancy, decrease in violence toward other students, decrease in self-harm, increased academic performance, decreased truancy. All of these things ripple out of this. And you know what? What really is disappointing to me is school connectedness is not measured on a school report card anywhere. It's not reported. So we get the school report card. And there was a talk around 2000, it was December 2015, and I, I did a, um, an interview on this. It looked like OCR, it looked like the feds were going to allow schools to set their own, um, one of their, their criteria to measure 
um, progress, you know, like a baseline in progress would be like school climate. And I was like, this is a great step. This is towards school connectedness. I don't think anything really ever came of that. But anyway, let us move on. Um, dun, 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 dun. Whenever one has a problem with a PSP learner, one should always visit personally with the parent or guardian first. I like that. I think it's, the personal touch is very important. Um, you know, even bringing it, uh, asking a parent to come into your office and just talk, just talk. Um, and I remember I did that once and a, a parent said to me, I was told by my, you know, the disability, whatever advocacy agency to not share anything with you or whatever. And I said, that, I, I, you know, I guess that's fine. You know, I just want to kind of know what the concerns are. And at that point I, I did just, I, I, I had a notebook and, or a notepad and I said, okay, all I'm going to do on here is, is just mark down some points. And, and then that you and I agree, like, so I understand what your main concerns are when we come out here, but I'm only going to use like this sheet and I'll give you a copy of the sheet, like before we go. So you have exactly what I have that built trust with the parent. Um, I actually have done home visits with parents, you know, sit down and, and ask if I can come to your home and we can talk. And, 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 you know, I, and here's, here's, here's the way to, I, I always approach that is, you know, I understand that you want the best for your child. I want the best for your child. The The people working with your child want the best for your child. Um, and, and right now, you know, we're, we're kind of not getting there. So, so we're going to work together to get there. And, and when you do that, you validate the parent. Um, it's a, it's a powerful statement. So, um, I, I close, you know, that, that section there with, you know, one, you make a home visit, but, after you do that document through like a letter back to the parent and it can be, you know, like a friendly, it can be more of a brief letter. And I, I, you know, I think bullet points are fine and stuff, but you know, it's like, Hey, you know, thanks for meeting with me on this date at your home. You express these concerns. I just want to make sure, please contact me if these aren't accurate. Um, and here's, here's what we agreed to do is next steps. And you can detail it out. Like, here's what you agreed to do. Um, you know, if they were going to, you know, talk with, um, you know, like, a an outside counselor or, you know, like I want my child uh, to, um, you know, get involved in some outside activities. So I'm going to talk to, you know, whatever it might be, the karate place, because I think it'd be, be a good outlet for them. I don't know, whatever it is, local park and recs. Um, and then, you know, things that you're going to do, like, you know, I, I'm going to look into the mentor program, you know, and see if your child can participate in that and, and whatever. So whatever it is, um, but you do that, that creates a record. And a record is, is a record is what you have to go by um, if there's litigation, one. But also, as a student moves through school, that's the only thing you have to go back on is to, to look at trying to understand that historical picture of the student. And it's become so easy for districts just to not do these records, just to handle things through this broad range of discretion. And that gets really, really dangerous, folks. So I'm asking you, you know, to, to be very aware that you are creating some type of records. I was I thought I was very um, astute doing that as a director. But sometimes it irritated parents. Like they'd be like, I don't need this letter of following up what we talked about. Like I'm really up, you know, I'm like, oh, I, and I'd explain, you know, I, I just need to do this. I said, I, I work with a lot of people. I work with a lot of parents. And I would just want to make sure we're very clear because we might have this discussion, you know, like three weeks from now or three months from now. And I want to make sure I'm I, I'm very clear on that, you know. So, um, dun, 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 dun. keep in mind there's a tremendous class distinction between educators and the majority of PSP learners. There was an elementary school that I worked with, and not when I was a director, but you know, a, a district I, I had, had worked with. I have various consulting things I do, but this district um, had the elementary school teachers ride the buses for their students and stop in and visit the parents. And a lot of them noticed that at the houses, like there weren't um, doors on the cabinets for in the kitchen, in the pantry and stuff like that. And, um, you know, there, there, there was generational poverty. And one of the things that also came out, and I talked to the principal in, in, in much detail about this in this one school, just like two years ago. And the principal said, you know, a lot of students didn't brush their teeth. They didn't have toothbrushes. So we worked with our local, you know, dental group in Lions Club, whatever. So we had toothbrushes, donate to the school, toothpaste, whatever. So when all students arrive to school, everybody brushes their teeth regardless. And we just say, 
we are learning life skills. We are learning how to present ourselves, you know, to, you know, to be, be responsible for our, our own, you know, care of ourselves. And, and everybody did it. And, um, you know, so some of those things might happen. And, and again, I see that as a non-discrimination um, movement that that principal took. It's one thing to have the students that don't have access to that go and, and have access to the bathroom and whatever to brush. It's one thing to to inculcate that as a full culture of saying, you know, we are using this because, you know, we're, we're, we all want to be responsible for our, our, ourselves. I know some of you might do this at home, some of you might not. Um, and then, you know, this, this helps us because, you know, we, we then are able to present with more, you know, confidence and we're healthier, we have more energy and things that, that springboard off of that. So um, the role of parent educator programs by the school, um, I think I, I kind of talked about that one earlier in a, in a shout out. Um, one of the things I, you know, fast families and schools together, I remember it was, um, it was a program, unfortunately, that, that got extinguished in a district. It, it just wasn't funded by the time I got there. But um, the district was was going around, I don't know, it was a bus, van or whatever, but then it would pick up parents who participated in this, and they would all get together and, in, in you know, the ingredients, and, you know, they would make, like, spaghetti and meatball suppers and uh, at the school. And it, and, and it was it was great. At least I heard it was great. Like, I never got to see it. But... Um, they had a high attendance rate. It was, you know, it was, but but then it get, you know, you got to get buy-in from your your superintendent and from your school board on things like that. So I mean, there'll be some situations you'll enter as a director that just aren't going to be a fit, and you have to realize that and decide if you're going to stick it out or move on. Um, and school boards change and administration changes and things like that. So I mean, it happens. It happens to all of us. Um, but anyway, in, in, in that case, you know, that was a, a relationship that was built between the parents and, and, and staff, and they were creating something, and um, it, was, it was just really good. And then there was, there was trust, and there was a, a relationship, so when things came up that were difficult, they were much easier to deal with. So, and who doesn't like spaghetti and meatballs? Come on, it's my daughter's, my youngest daughter's favorite meal. So, um, dun, 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 dun. yeah, I don't know about that. So, folks, I know we're at an hour. I'm, I'm going through. I'm, I'm going through. You know, I, but again, I've got page. I got pages here. Okay. So, like, I really want to do this well for you because we are not meeting face to face. So, this does take a little bit of time. You know, if we were in an actual class, this would be very natural you know we'd have our discussions and things like that but it's not the way this is set up but i but i think this this works well if you have questions email me specific questions i'll email i can answer those through fireside chats too but um so um anyway um i put in your on, on basically it's kind of page three but you know avoid blaming parents um for you know the the situation that their their child is in that happens. People do that. I've I've been in situations where people blame the parents. Um, I I kind of approach that as I Apollo thirteen thinking. Um, I I put an end to it right away. I'm like, no, it's not an option. Like we we are not going down this road, and you're not going to do it. And we don't even have like the three minute gripe session. You don't do that. You don't do it. You don't do it. You don't allow it as a pupil services director. And again, I approach it as an Apollo thirteen. Here's the situation we're at. Um, here's what we, we've got to figure it out and we're going to solve it. And in most cases you saw, and when, when you take this away from people, when you take, a, when you tell people, listen, you, you, the, the, you have no option. We will solve this, this, this issue with, with the parent, we're going to work with, this will be solved. People are like, okay. And, and then they put their mind towards solving it. They, they know there's no back door out of this situation. So I, sometimes I think you just got to play hardball like that and say, this is, this is just the way that it is. Like we're solving this. This is an Apollo thirteen. We're gonna we're we're getting this getting this crew back. Um, I, you know, divorced parents. Yeah, that you know, it's complicated. One of the one of the things you need to do is is as people services director, <laughs> make sure you're talking with your um, secretaries and teachers of of you know when they share information. So if they get a phone call um, that they know it is the parent, 
um, you know, I, I've been through this a number of times too. Um, not only where information comes in and it's like, is a student there today or things like that? And it's a, a, a relative calling who really shouldn't have access to that information or they send an email. Um, but it is also now becoming um, prevalent in groomers or sex trafficking where they're finding kids' profiles online. They can see, they study the images and they're like, oh, you go to this um, elementary school or middle school or high school or whatever, typically middle school, high school. And then they might call the school, you know, to see if the, the student is, is there that day. Um, and I mean, it, all of these weird types of things happen. They might just then, you know, show up um, after a practice and be there of saying, oh, you know, hey, I was just driving through. I know you do this. Like, and and I'm, I, you wouldn't believe the extent to which this is happening. This is probably, no, it's not probably. This is the number one um, area I am contacted to consult um, on a national level. With, I mean, I was asked today by one of my substantial clients to do more in this. And I'm like, I already have like a basically like a full-time job, except in summer, you know, I, I, I just, you know, switch it kind of fully over in a consulting mode. But, um, and, and I'm doing a, a special on this. Um, it, is, it is just unbelievable. Um, so I, I work with, um, with an expert out of San Antonio very closely on this. Um, and, you know, it is, it is one of those things which, again, as a people services director, you need to be very aware of when it comes to bullying and harassment. You know, we think of those things in social media bullying, but the grooming is, is just taking over. And these are where the lawsuits are are just sprouting up in, and um, insurance carriers are settling these things for like eight nine million dollars. Um, but what happens then is the you know district gets sued, but then you know it might be the pupil services director gets sued or the teacher gets sued because, and the counselor gets sued because there wasn't anything teaching kids about you know what is grooming, how to report grooming, maybe the school system of reporting. Um, bullying, harassment, threats didn't have anything to capture grooming. That's where I work as an expert in user interface and these multi-million dollar systems. Um, so, I mean, just to be aware of it. So, dun, 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 dun. so anyway, I put something in here, which I, I think was uh, stupid on my part. I put... Um, on the bottom of page three, as a school leader, be sure to maintain parent advisory groups to a strictly advisory capacity. That I think is is absolutely necessary. Meaning, um, you know, parent advisory groups help inform decisions. Like I did this when we did an allergy policy in one of my districts. Like we had a parent group and then we also had open forums a community could attend. But basically the decision was made by myself the director of food service making a recommendation to the school board to to, to vote on a policy, um, you know, so you know that's not out, that's not a popularity contest of people you know by majority votes saying yeah this is what we're going to go with no it's like we research this so we take into consideration the input from people but you know the ultimate decision lies with with me in that case um, I put um, failure to do so is equivalent to turning Attica over to the inmates as a stupid statement on my part, and that's going to be expunged in the future. That's not, you know, it all. That, that's just a. I shouldn't have put that in there, but um, but basically, what it does, though, I, I think in that regard is the advisory committee doesn't know your long-term planning as a district. They don't know the functioning of the district. They don't know everything that goes into type one diabetes management or your cross-contamination process for allergies. They don't know, um, you know, your bully prevention, K-12 scope and sequence. And all the, they, they don't know all these things. They don't know Act 309. They don't know the law. So when they come in, they're coming in with the knowledge that is probably more mainstream media, which is more of the stuff that's covered on TV and and not really the, um, the very complicated inner workings of the district, which you are familiar with in your role and your expertise. So just, just I want to put that out there. I want to put that out there. I think it's very important. And we're going to close here with um, the last part of this. Um, immersion in lingui uh, limited English proficiency is, a co is controversial um, as, as inclusion in special education, whole language, and reading. So um, basically, I, I think... 
the movement is more toward inclusive practices for English language learners, you know, that they're in the, the main, not, not the mainstream classroom, but it, I guess the regular education classroom. Pull out L ELL programs seem to be going by the wayside. I just don't, I just don't see those as much anymore, but the best you can do go, I mean, if this is rather new to your district, then find districts like Wassa, Eau Claire, La Crosse, who have who have worked with this with a long time, you know, you know, Wassa with a among population, you know, for 25 years plus, um, you know, small districts, it, it might be very new. Um, Arcadia had a rapid change um, in, in their district uh, population um, once Ashley Furniture expanded out. So, you know, you can check in with other districts in, in you know, take the field trip. So, um, so the bottom the, the the very last thing is the professional roles and responsibility of administrators and teachers are fundamentally different. So yeah, and as an administrator, you need to be accountable for the vision and um, and and you you are responsible to many more people, <laughs> both in a vertical structure, meaning your superintendent, your school board, the community at large, and then down you know with your your teachers, your aides, bus custodians kitchen staff that they understand like cross contamination who has food allergies things like that. all of these things you know vertically horizontally you're responsible to these people um and you also need to lead professional development and uh, and here's the big point i'm going to put out there one is i did a study when i was in a district a few years ago of the professional development that people were attending and um what what i found and this is what i suspected i looked at everything that everybody was attending um kind of part, specific to the to the realm of you know people services and i found that we had a ton of people attending autism conferences and we had a ton of people the year before and the year before and the year before and it became a familiar conference people would go there they they knew people at the conference conferences were well done but we also had a very high and growing need of students with mental health needs um, students with with math needs and we sent one teacher to a math conference, one special education teacher. And I don't know if we sent anybody to a conference with, with having to do with mental health needs. So we sat down and we looked at what empirically are the needs of our district. Okay, what it, what is, where are the discipline referrals coming out? Um, where are our test scores coming out? Where are our you know, grade reports coming out, professional learning communities? And then we matched our professional development into those areas, which was a, a huge plus. It angered a lot of people because they're like, I don't get to go to this conference that I've always been entitled to go to for like the last five years. Well, yeah, because, you know, we don't need you to go to an autism conference or three of them every year. Not that we don't have autism needs, but we need to be very balanced and we are completely neglecting other areas. So that's something, too, as a people services director, you want to be aware of. One of the things I do in in my typical protocol as an expert witness, okay, and and I'm and, okay. So I'm going to give you a little insight into this. So as an expert witness, um, you know, you you have to be you you have to be proven to be an expert. So you know, I have a PhD. I've had a number of years where I studied, you know, schools from UW Madison, powerful, you know was rated number one in the world for a long time. I don't know, it's two, three right now. But um, I did a two-year fellowship, a paid fellowship, really intense. You know, worked with the head of military medicine, head of NASA, things like that. So, <clears throat> I mean, and, uh, you know, I've been on public television. I did the Sandy, the presentation the for public television in response to Sandy Hook. It aired in all 50 states, I think eight times or more in Canada, and they still use it to this day. Um, you know, so so I've had these things. I continue to do research. I have, a, I have an article I'm writing right now for School Business Affairs Magazine International, um, which is a very prominent magazine. It's all the school business managers get it. They asked me to write a magazine specific to the the expert witness perspective and the, the liabilities for a district um, and how to best prepare for those liabilities because because a lot of districts are facing increased litigation. Probably don't see it as much right now in Wisconsin. Doesn't mean it, it doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that I don't get contacted by lawyers in Wisconsin. Um, but, um, you know, this this is... So what I do 
you know, when I'm contacted, you know, I'm charging three to $800 an hour right off the bat. And I can put a price out there and attorneys will boom, they'll go at it. Like they'll never even flinch at it. And uh, in some of the cases, I just consult on helping them establish a case. And some of the cases I work with, like, here's the 200 questions that you need to ask this person through a deposition. Here's exactly what you need to ask for from disclosure, like these handbooks. Um, you need to go into these schools and take pictures per policy that they've posted their non-discrimination practices up on boards. I want the newspaper that has the copy of the um, child fine. I want copies of those through disclosure, through subpoena sent to me. I know exactly where to go on all of these things. And I also want every professional development that has been done, maybe in the last five years regarding suicide prevention, harassment. I want the documents. I want the people that attend it. If they, if they didn't attend, how did they get the training? If they started um, two months into school year, what was the induction process? I want all of that. And then also how they had the opportunity to ask questions and you know how you measured change from baseline, any drills you might have run, things like this. So I know exactly where to go and all of a sudden. So I'm very, very helpful <laughs> if you bring me in like ahead of time, like my, my major clients on the West Coast have done for a number of years. Um, but if I'm coming in as an expert witness, I can generate these things typically with legal counsel in a matter of hours and um, – if, if you, again, you know, we talk about handbooks that don't have readability levels. We talk about if you haven't done a suicide prevention training, if you haven't um, worked with, you know, middle schoolers on understanding what harassment is, how to report harassment, how to access the reporting system. Is it tell an adult? Is it an actual reporting system like Sprigio.com? Things like that. So, you, you know, professional development is a big part of your role, professional development. And the fact that you you keep the materials and you document who participated in those and you do have a follow-up with that. And if you can add in there some competency measure, you know, like people do um, a five-question survey after that that you send out on a Google Doc, um, that really helps. Um, not necessarily, you know, but I'm, I'm telling you things right now that I want you to start thinking about because as we get into assignments in this class and whatever – um, you know, and some of you are, are probably thinking, you know, here's here's a story, folks. I'm going to this is where I'm, I authentically am going to end. I mean, I know I've eaten up a lot of your time. I'm, but I remember the year was 1998. It was late at night. It was winter and I got done teaching. And then I had a a graduate class for my master's in education. So I have a, a BS in I don't know what communicative disorders, master's in speech language, a master's of it in, in um, school administration and so on, MSc. And then I also have a PhD in educational leadership policy analysis from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, so anyway, uh, my, my MSc out of Superior, um, I remember going to class from 6 to 10 at night. So I get done teaching, I go to class from 6 to 10. And, and we were there till 10 o'clock. Professor Powers, Professor Keating, you know, we were all there. Um and, uh, you know, tired, long nights, coffee. I mean, but it was great, you know, um, people you get to know. But I remember, I'll never forget one class where Dr. Power said to us, um, he said, all of you um, will be sued at one point in your career. <laughs> all of you will be sued. And, and you know, we kind of brush it off of like, well, you know, districts have errors and emissions policies, which kind of cover, you know, if there's things that happen in a school, you know, unforeseen thing, you know, the backboard falls down and, and, you know, harms a student and who knows, you know, whatever happens or something like that. Um, so, you know, somebody, um, you know, gets, gets, gets hit by, by a vehicle, you know, because they run out in front. I, I don't know, errors and emissions, things like that. The thing is, though, you know, we kind of brush it off, but there, there's a big change right now in culture, and I write about this in this article for School Business Affairs because I see this firsthand in litigation where because of the diminishment of school unions, um, litigation is being more and more filed against the school board and against individuals. And then the school board has a tendency to say that person was acting outside of their job description when they did this. Um, and unless, I mean, how many of you have looked at your job description lately? Do you know what it really entails? 
Um, so what the school district is doing per their legal counsel, and by the way, legal counsel, like legal, they just give you advice and thoughts. Like I, and sometimes I would say, I'm not doing what legal counsel says because I don't believe in it, you know, and you get a different opinion or whatever, and you don't have to follow any of these. It's not like the, you bow down to the attorney. No, absolutely not. Like, you know, um, but anyway, um, you know, I would, I would follow, you know, I, you would get the information from, from, you know, legal counsel and, and make an educated, you know, decision from then of, of, of what to do. So, um, I don't know, you know, it, it, it's just one of those things, folks, is I want you to be very, very well prepared. Um, and again, in these cases that I've recently been involved with, it's, it's litigation, you know, that has largely to do with bullying and harassment. That, those areas are blossoming. Grooming is coming on board. Um, if it's suicide related to bullying, I, I work exclusively kind of in those cases across the country. There's only a handful of people that do what I do who are certified as an expert witness in all 50 states. Um, and, you know, it is, it is one of those things where you need to make sure too, that you know what you're getting into, <laughs> that you, you talk to your own insurance provider and, and talk about umbrella policy. Is it right or is it wrong? Not right or wrong, but you know, just, just so you're aware, do due, due diligence of that. Or even if the board pays that, I guess that's something <laughs> you might want to bring out there because, the board could say, and the school district could say, you were acting outside of your job duty, and then the errors and omissions might not extend to you, and you might find yourself battling a, a, a two front thing of like trying to get the the a, a suit to say the board that you're acting under under your role as as an educator in the system, and then also you know battling the parent. And I've seen a number of people have these two front kind of a, um, things going on. Very expensive and very long. You know, legal cases just for discovery alone. The one case I was in discovery went almost a year. Um, by the time they got done with depositions, we got done pulling all of the the reports and things like that. So, um, it just again, it's a it's a it's a field, and it's not. It, the thing is, like, you know, litigation. If it comes around, like the IEP. Um, providing of the IP, that's typically through due process, and, and that gets that gets worked out. You know, that's not a that's probably not a big thing to fret about, you know. But what happens now is we get into bullying and harassment and harm to self and harm to others and suicide, and those um, and also you know gender identification uh, issues. Those get they're very. Uh, they're not well defined and, and they're very interpretive and who knew what, when and, and what actions were meeting the standard of care and what actions weren't meeting the standard of care. So those you need to be very, very well aware of. I believe through this class, I'm going to give you an insight that nobody else is going to give you. Not that I am some super being or instructor or anything like that, but I really, really want you to come out of this very, very well prepared on all fronts. Because a little bit of, of work up front can, can just position you and your staff so much better down the road to lessen chances um, of, of these types of things. And if, if these things happen, because like anybody can be sued for anything, but if those type of things happen, that you're just in a so much better position um, in, in those situations. Um, I, I had an instructor a few years ago. Um, who was in her first year in a pretty large district. And she contacted me. She had taken my class like a year before and contacted me about halfway through the school year. And she said, hey, I've been like some a couple things. Like one is we don't have our five-year non-discrimination report done. And second is like um, I'm not quite sure of like our allergy processes. Like I thought the nurses were – handling that or whatever, but then apparently they're not. And I'm like, whoa, like, <laughs> okay, let's sit down. Let's figure out what you need to get a handle on and what falls under your job description because, yeah, I mean, this is very important stuff. Student has an anaphylactic, you know, re reaction to something and and whatever. And, and uh, you know, that person, um, you know, wasn't fully informed by the school district as they came into that position. Um, so, again, I want to give you those, the, that, the questions to ask, to, to, you know, and, and to best prepare yourself. So I don't know. I, you know, these, these things aren't going to all be, be to this length, but anyway, folks, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I really like the first day of class, you know, you're in there, you're posting and 
everybody, you've been active pollsters. You've been great. You've been sharing a lot. Keep sharing. You know, I will, um, you know, I'll share a lot through these. I'll, I will get in. I'll be making posts. Now, obviously, because there's 12 of you and there's one of me, I'm not going to be able to respond to everybody for every post, you know, but um, keep posting. And uh, I, I, I really, really enjoy this class. I, I teach uh, several inclusion classes for Viterbo. You know, I think I've taught like 60 classes for Viterbo since 2002, 2003, I don't know, whatever. But um, but this is a very special class because, because you know, we, we get, to, we get to, to have a discourse at an administrative level. Um, and, and I really, really, really cherish that, really value this class, really value the program, the people that I've worked with for a number of years. So um, any questions, uh, send me an email, post in threads. Please set aside the time to watch this or at least to listen to it. There's free programs on, you know, you go online, you can rip an MP3 to an, or, or you can rip a YouTube thing to an MP3 and listen to it in the car or listen to it in the background or whatever. So. All right, folks, it is getting late here. It is actually five minutes to midnight, so I'm not sure when this video will be up. I don't know if I'll get it up tonight. So, um, And it is a brisk 54 degrees down here in the studio, so cold. All right, thank you so much.